What are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? All right, Bernie Marcus, it's great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. All right, great to be here. Great to be on your show. I heard a lot about it. And I know a lot of my friends have been on your show and have enjoyed it a lot. Well, I've been excited to talk to you ever since uh, Arthur Blank was on a few years ago. And he brought up the name Bernie Marcus so many times during the course of our conversation to the point I said, I got to talk to this Bernie Marcus guy. So it's cool that we're getting a chance to do it. But I want to start actually go back a little bit earlier in your life. In fact, I was reading about your parents and the fact that they were immigrants from Russia and Ukraine, which is two interesting countries, especially with what we have going on right now in the world. But I'm curious from your perspective, having immigrant parents, of how that affected and impacted your view of the American dream, given that they'd come here from other countries? Well, that's, that's the whole purpose of it. Uh, we see people climbing over the border today. Why are they trying to come here? Uh, they're trying to come here because they know this is a better place, that this is the land where they can become who they are, where they could be successful, my parents came here because of uh, anti-Semitism in the Ukraine and Russia, and staying there, if they had stayed there, I probably wouldn't be here today because I'm sure we would have been caught up in the Holocaust, World War II. But they had the strength and courage to make that trip, their parents as well, and their families, and, uh, we had one uncle that came over, very successful, became a lawyer, and one by one, he brought his brothers and sisters over, and it took a number of years, took eight years. My father renewed his passport in a uh, refugee camp over a period of eight years, and he had to pay in rubles in order for him to keep that passport. If he didn't have that passport, he couldn't have come in the United States. And he couldn't work during that time because he was Jewish. So uh, the, the family uh, really was very courageous. Uh, they survived. All of them came to America uh, because it's the land of the free. Uh, it's the land where uh, a person could be who they are and achieve things that you could not do anywhere else in the world. And I will tell you, regardless of what the political situation is here today, the situation is the same. America is the greatest land of all. I love it. I love this country as my parents did. And I think that my success, all of the good things that happened to me could never have happened anywhere else in this country, and in the world, anywhere, UK, Europe, Germany. If you don't come from uh, royalty, you don't come from rich parents, you don't make it. We were poor as church. I mean, we were so poor. Uh, if we didn't have food, there was no, for us, there was no blanket, no security blanket. If we didn't have food, we ate spaghetti. Uh, and we ate a lot of spaghetti. It's, it's a wonder I'm not, well, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm torn toward the Italian. My friend Ken Langone says I'm part Italian uh, because I ate so much spaghetti in my early days because that's all that was available to us. So um, I think that they were great and they are the basis of who I am. Uh, my mother was a great teacher of mine she is the one that really uh, lent me her experience, her brains, her feelings, uh, and her desires. And she always said to me, Bernie, you could be anything you want. This is America. It's the golden land. She didn't say it that way. It's the golden land. And you could become anything you want. And me like a fool, I really believed her. <laughs> 
I love it. I was at a hosting a workshop a few weeks ago, and one of the attendees came to America. He's from India. He came to America when he was 15. He got up and gave like a five minute speech that left some of us more entitled people who don't have that rich experience of living both ways. He left it made us feel much more appreciative of what we have. And I think sometimes we need to we need to put ourselves in, in, in situations where we can understand just how good we have it because there are other people's life experiences if we tap into those we could learn from them and it'll make us appreciate what we have so much more and i think we all need to do a better job that it sounds like you you got that at home and your upbringing and that's that that's a big reason for you to have developed your appreciation of life of this country and and, and ultimately develop the work ethic that you have yeah recently there was a poll on millennials and it, it was a really startling poll because it showed that almost 50% of millennials believe that socialism is better than capitalism. They are so spoiled rotten, don't understand why all these people are fighting to come here. I mean, people, people are taking their lives in their hands, crossing the Rio Grande. Why the hell are they doing it? They're doing it because they know what we have, they want. They're running away from what the millennials want. This is so stupid, it's hard to comprehend. They're running away from exactly what the millennials want. Government control, uh, high taxes, uh, people telling you what to do, how to do it, what not to do. That's socialism. Capitalism is what made the Home Depot. And I must tell you that if it hadn't been for capitalism, Arthur and I would not be who we are today. We had no money, we were undercapitalized. Uh, we went to the market and because there was a market where we could sell shares in our dream to shareholders who were willing to take that risk on us uh, we were able to get enough money to continue our growth one store at a time until today we have, I don't know, 2,700 stores, 500,000 associates, uh, and a beat goes on. Uh, that, that's capitalism. This age group, the millennials you're talking about, how does that come to be, to be so misguided? Well, you have, you have college professors who have never worked a day in their lives, don't have a clue. It all goes back to philosophy, and it goes back to a very structured program, I believe, that uh, the socialists have a real program, and they have one that they're putting in place, and they're attacking the schools. Uh, that's why you have CRT in schools. That's why you have... Uh, you know, the teaching that they have in schools today, but certainly in the universities is corrupt, totally corrupt. And uh, kids that graduate from, from uh, uh, college today, they stay socialist until they get their first paycheck. <laughs> when they get the paycheck and all of a sudden, a lot of money moved out of that paycheck. And they say, what the hell is this? And that, and that's where you have socialism. The more, the more you let them take out, the more you lose control of your life. And they're told what to do, what to do, and what not to do. And they're told what to say and what not to say. And they're told that uh, if you make a mention of this, you will be outed uh, and you'll be woke. And, and that, that's the death of America, freedom of speech. I, I have to tell you that about 10 years ago, I warned my colleagues. I said, we are gonna lose the freedom of speech in this country. And that's the most blessed thing we have. People like myself to be able to get up and say whatever we wanna say, because that's what's on our mind. They're gonna shut us up if they can. And they have tried to do it and they've been very successful. Growing up, I read that you had many jobs leading up. Because you, you didn't start Home Depot until you were 49. Is that right? 
Yes. So you have many jobs leading up to that, like a 49 year old entrepreneur starting what has come, has gone on to become the Home Depot, which is amazing. But I want to learn a little, go back a little bit before that. You had like a service oriented job. What did you learn earlier on in your life from having jobs like that, a variety of jobs about people, about service, about community? What did you learn from those earlier jobs that then helped you do so well later on at the Home Depot? I think the biggest lesson that I learned is that you don't live on an island by yourself. That, in fact, you need people around you. And that you have to listen to people around you and, and listen to their thoughts. And that will make you a better person. Um, working on a table, you know, depending on tips, you have to have a personality. So that means you had to you had to joke, you had to listen, you had to be able to talk to people in an intelligent way. The word communication comes to mind, which is the biggest word that I know. And communication means two things. It means one thing, being able to speak, but it means two, being able to listen. And I learned early on that if you didn't listen, you didn't make it. If you didn't listen, you didn't get it. And if you didn't get it, people didn't get you. And therefore, they didn't have the confidence in you. And I think that the learning experience that I had was actually this communication thing, which I don't know that teach in colleges. I think they teach you more about stupidity than they do about intelligent things. <laughs> the ability to listen you know, I, I wanted to go to medical school. As you know, in my book, I, t I talk about that. I wanted to be a doctor. You didn't have the money to bribe them, right, you huh? Know, I couldn't make the $10,000 bribe in order to get in because they had a... What was that all about now? So there's a $10,000 bribe to get into Harvard Medical School, right? Yeah, well, they had a quota system for Jews. In okay. other words, they would only take 10% Jews. By the way, that was every medical school in the United States. Really? Work together. Everyone, Yale, Johns Hopkins, every single medical school had a 10% quota. So only 10% Jews got in. So the only Jews that got into medical school were Jews that had money. My family had very little. And if you put my whole family together, shook them up upside down, you couldn't get $10,000, you stood on your head. So I had to pass on medical. Uh, by the way, I would have been a good doctor. I could have been <laughs> successful. I could have been somebody. Seems like it worked out okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, so, worked, it worked out okay. So well, I, one of the things that happened was uh, at one point with Arthur Blank and others like Handy Dan, I believe is the name, right? And there was uh, some, some disagreements there. And all of a sudden you find yourself without a job figuring out like, what are we going to do? Can you, can you take us back to that moment in time of what happened? Because I think there are people, great, excellent leaders at times lose their jobs or, or, or life happens. And, and sometimes it feels like the end of the world. And I'm just curious of, of taking us to your headspace and figuring out what are we going to do next, as well as then becoming an entrepreneur at age 49. Well, it is the end of the world. When you've been successful, you know, up until the age of 49, I was very successful. I, every job that I had, I was able to produce figures. I was able to make a profit. I was able to make money for whoever I worked for. And, and we had built Handy Dan to a very substantial company. It was one that stood on its own two feet, made a lot of money. And we were supporting Dalen, which was the master company that owned Handy Dan. And frankly, we kept them alive for quite a while. But I had a bad relationship with the CEO of Handy Dan. He hated me. I hated him. It worked out really well. He was a very nasty guy. He called himself Ming the Merciless. And when I talk about communication before, 
there's another thing you have to be able to do. You have to lead people. And you have to have people that want to work for you, not because this is a job, but because they like working for you, because they like the atmosphere. You allow them to thrive. You allow them to grow. You allow them to be part of the picture. And he didn't believe in it. He, he was totally against that. He called himself being the merciless because that's the way he operated as being the merciless. And you either thought his way, if you didn't think his way, he killed you. And that's exactly what he did to me, Arthur and Ron Brill. He killed us in one fell swoop, we were gone. I will tell you, it was a shock. I'd never been fired in my life, especially not from somewhere where I was doing a great job and producing a lot of money. I never expected it, but he had to get rid of me because I was trouble. I was trouble because I would say to him and tell him all the things he didn't want to hear. He wanted to surround himself with people who agreed with him on everything. And you know, this type of thing, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. And I was not a yes, yes, yes guy. I would tell him exactly what I thought about him. And I thought about his policies and he couldn't take that. And because of that, he found a way to get rid of us. It was a dishonest way. It was inaccurate. But meanwhile, he had the power to do it. And boom, we're out of work. And it was a terrible blow to us, all of us. And I will tell you, it was not easy to deal with. And uh, emotionally, it took a lot out of you. You have this ego build up in you where you think you're pretty good. You think you know what you're doing and all of a sudden somebody could rip your legs out from under you. And he did. And it, it, it left us in a spot like, what are we gonna do with the rest of our lives? You know, Arthur was a little younger than I am and uh, it didn't affect him as much, but being where I was, what the hell do I do with my life? I will tell you that that's when I, the relationship began or really yeah, had culminated with Ken Langone. Ken and I had become very close by this time. He had bought a lot of stock at Handy Dan. And very frankly, he told me that I was going to be fired uh, because I was trying to encourage him to sell his shares back to Dale, which they wanted to buy the tremendous profit. And I said, he owed it to his shareholders. And he said, you're going to get fired. You know, when I got fired, and I called him. I thought he was going to say, oh, Bernie, poor Bernie. You know, you poor thing. He didn't. He said, you just been hit in the ass with a golden horseshoe. He said, let's open that store that you told me about. And it was a store I, discur I described with him. One day we were touring in Houston and he asked me a question. He said, why are you opening so many stores so close? And I said, because one day someone's going to open a store that's going to put these stores out of business. And I had in my mind the handy day at the Home Depot. And he said, what, what is it? And I said, I'm not going to tell you about it. I have it in my mind and I'm not going to share it with you. And so he said, you're going to be hit in the ass with a golden horseshoe. And then he said, let's open that store that you talked about. He says, let me, let me get some, some people who made money on your company on Handy Dan. Let them put the money into this, this new company, this new entity, and I'll support it. And you and you and Arthur, et cetera. And so, uh, Arthur and I put our heads together. And we strategized, we put it into, into uh, words and into budgets and into, into objectives and strategic plans. The concept of Home Depot, which was totally unknown at that time, uh, a big store, amazing store that carried everything, that sold at prices direct from manufacturers and not through retail not through wholesalers, and was able to pass the savings on to the customer. 
in addition to that, having people on the floor of the store who were tradesmen, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, uh, the kind of people that knew how to help people do things. And the world, the world didn't buy it. In fact, when we went public, and I talk about going public, we had a hell of a time selling shares of the stock. We couldn't give it away. Nobody wanted to buy it because nobody believed in the concept. Nobody believed that you could sell cheaper, get the kind of volume you're talking about, cover your expenses, and make a profit. Nobody believed that. But that concept had come to me because of my experience back at two guys many, many years before that if you sold a lot of something, you're able to overcome a lot of deficiencies, pay for your overhead, and make it pay. This was strategic plan number one. I remember when we presented it to the, uh, the new shareholders, and often said to me, the numbers don't work. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they just don't work. They, they just don't work. Arthur was an accountant. And the numbers didn't work. And I said, well, what do you need? He said, you need, you need much more volume. I said, good, put more volume in. And Arthur said, I just can't do that. And I said, no, you just do it. And Arthur said, no, no, I can't. I said, do it. Just put the volume in. And I promise you, we will do those kind of volumes. And we will cover the overhead. And we will make a profit. And that's the basis of Home Depot. That's how Home Depot started. Wow. Um, so you, you gave a little bit of insight into how you and Arthur work together. So he's the accountant. He's the numbers guy. It sounds like he's more of the realist. You are more of the Steve Jobs reality distortion field. <laughs> I sense for a second of like, we will do it, put more volume. How did that... Because it, it, I'm, I'm curious, one, about how you and Arthur and your, your, your colleagues work together, but also for others who are going to work with partners or other senior leaders at a business. I think there's probably a lot to learn how you guys work together. So what were the keys and the, and the dynamics of your guys' relationship and what made it work so well? Well, we were the original, not the original, but maybe the second odd couple. We we're totally odd. I mean... Arthur is meticulous. He's pedantic. He's a little bit anal on what he does. Uh, and I'm, I'm a free thinker. I'm a promotional guy. I'm a marketing guy. Um, I, I think big and I think outside the box. And it takes a guy like Arthur to rein me in where I've gone too far. And he learned how to rein me in, and I learned how to listen to him and, 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 and adjust myself when Arthur was right and I was wrong. Uh, so it worked out for us as a team. Uh, we had a relationship. I, you know, it's going on 40 years now, and we still love each other, and we still talk to each other a lot. And uh, I say to Arthur, I've been married to you for more than your own wife, so all your wives put together. <laughs> and, 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 and it's true, and it's true. Uh, but, but he learned from me, and I learned from him. And we learned we had mutual respect. So if there was an issue, and one of us felt really strong about it, the other adopted that issue. Uh, we didn't fight about issues because ultimately our lives were on the line and we knew that it had to work. And if one of us felt so strongly about it, we both had to join together and, and make a partnership of it and support each other. In other words, you couldn't say, uh, okay, we're gonna go along with it. And then you talk to subordinates and say, he's crazy. He's out of his mind. He shouldn't have done this. This is not the way it worked. The minute we, ad we, we adopted a pro policy, that was it. And we both jumped on it and supported it 100%. For, for people who are 
starting a partnership now, a business, or they're in one, what are a few pieces of advice you'd give to them who are, they're going to work with a couple of others or one other person to say, to do it most effectively? I get one of the pieces is, well, you can't have two of the exact same type, right? You, you need the yin and yang. You needed the odd couple in a way. That seems like one of them. What are some other pieces of advice you'd give to someone who is going to work with co-founders? You, you better make sure that you like who you do. Mm -hmm. You don't like them. You're dead. If you dislike them, and by the way, I did have a partner early on in my life when we owned drugstores, and we didn't get along from the day we joined. <clears throat> you know, I was just at, 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 at each other's throat. That could never work out. And in the long run, that would be a disaster. So if you can't appreciate each other and you don't respect each other, and if everything somebody else says you think is wrong, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be finished. You're not gonna be able to accomplish anything you want to do. It's 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 a dance. It's really a dance. And uh, you know, many relationships I I see plenty of my friends who joined in partnerships. They go on for five, ten years, fifteen years, and then all of a sudden one day it falls apart and basically it falls apart because of the families. That's why Arthur and I had a plan that none of our children would ever be in the business. Hmm. He said, we don't want to get the wives involved. Once you get the wives involved, you have another entity that's involved and interfering with your decision-making. So we kept the business separated from our wives. And we hmm. kept them out of the business, and we kept our kids out of the business. Although my son did work early on because we needed him at the beginning to recruit managers and train them, and he did a damn good job of it. But at one point, I realized that wasn't going to work, and I convinced him to leave and become a professor of philosophy. <laughs> you love those professors. I love it. You write about the, the core values of creativity, autonomy, and strategic impatience as crucial to a business success. Can you, can you talk to me more about those core values of creativity, autonomy, and strategic impatience? Well, you know, if you don't know where you want to go, it's hard to get there. You know, if I don't set a strategic plan, and the strategic plan may be a, a three-year plan, a two-year plan. I like five-year plans, and I would constantly be thinking about where we're going to be in five years. I let Arthur operate the present, and I stayed in the future. Hmm. Uh, what we're going to do merchandising-wise, advertising-wise, promotion-wise, uh, personnel wise, uh, an author would put the pieces together and he would make sure that they came out right and that the budgets were accurate and that the financials were accurate, but that the budgets that we gave the board were pretty accurate, uh, you know, as close as you can get. We didn't fool around with that. And uh, he did that part of the business and then dotted the I's and crossed the T's. And I was the free thinker. But but having done that, you have to think in terms of where you want to go. Who do you want to be when you grow up? Who do you want to be? Um, you know, every business, I, I believe, has a, a turning point where you can't stay the same. I'll give you a perfect example. AMP is a perfect example. Sears Roebuck is a great example. They ran a great business. They own the business. For crying out loud, they own the hardware business. They own that business totally. And they blew it. And how did they blow, blow, blow it? They blew it because they stayed doing the same thing year after year. They couldn't change. Hmm. They were so more bound by bureaucracy and by their, their, their overhead 
uh, and the amount of people that they had making the set of discussions. You know, Arthur and I had a bathroom that we shared. We had two offices and a bathroom. We would go in the bathroom and I would say, Arthur, we have to do this or do that. Or he would say, I have it. And we'd say, okay, let's do it. That was our, that was our committee. That was our bureaucracy. And so, and we went out and did it. And we didn't have the interference that they have today. I couldn't be a CEO today for all the money in the world. You, you have to be surrounded today by lawyers and accountants and God knows, uh, HR people coming through your nose. Uh, you just can't make a move. But that will change also. The American people will change that. When you think about leaders that you want to hire to work on your team, uh, both when you worked at Home Depot and beyond, what are some of the must-have qualities in a person to get hired to be a leader on your team? Well, I think that yeah, it's it's the philanthropy world also. Yep. You know, we're 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 running a lot of different businesses in the philanthropy. You haven't gotten to that point yet, but every one of these businesses needs a CEO, and you have to find somebody who in my mind is entrepreneurial. That means they see outside the box. That means they, they're not linear. They just don't think in terms of, this is the way it's been done. That's the way I'm gonna do it. Step by step by step. It doesn't work that way. You have to step outside the box and you have to start thinking in terms of what could work. And I'll give you a good example. Good example would be what we did with the Avalon, uh, and that's the treatment of tra post-traumatic stress and uh, traumatic brain injury. Well, if we kept going where we were going before, we would be nowhere. And today, we actually have hospitals set up dealing with traumatic brain injury and different entities dealing with post-traumatic stress. And the way we did it was stepping outside the box, not doing it the way you normally would do it, but hop skipping it and jumping this and jumping that and thinking in terms of where you want to go. We want to take care of all the veterans that have traumatic brain injury, but we also want to be available for civilians like Tua, you know, Tua, the football player mm -hmm. at the Miami, well, he had traumatic brain injury. Where the hell does he go? He has nowhere to go. They don't have a treatment for it. There is no treatment for traumatic brain injury, believe it or not. In this day and age where we have a treatment for cancer of the little toe, you don't have treatment for traumatic brain injury. If you get into a concussion uh, through an accident, uh, you go to a hospital, uh, they bed rest. That's not an answer. That doesn't do it. That doesn't take away your dizziness doesn't take away your inability to sleep, doesn't take away your pain. It doesn't take your your ability to function as a human being. Uh, be able to listen and, and just function with other human beings. It's very, very tough. And we have all that data and we're trying to spread it now and we're doing it in a way that is entrepreneurial. We're doing it one by one. We're bringing in better places. We have Tulane, we have Jefferson, we have uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. We have the, the uh, University of Jacksonville. Uh, we have Operation Share in Atlanta. We have a lot of places that will treat these people and treat them really well. And as the numbers get it, come in and the data comes in, we will eventually sell it to the medical profession and say, what do you have? And they'll tell us the same thing. We don't have anything. And we'll say, we have this, this works. And it works better than 90% of the time. Therefore, good, good, you know, good intelligence tells you 
you have to adopt this. And we hope that in the future, this is going to happen. Our dream is to have, as I said, goals before. Our dream is to have a hospital in every place we have veterans in the United States. This book that we've been referencing is called Kick Up Some Dust, Lessons on Thinking Big, Giving Back, as we talked about, and Doing It Yourself. And I'm curious, your co-author, Catherine's here as well, and so I'd like to hear from both of you about this. What was the process like to get these stories out of your mind onto the page? How much of it was talking it through with Catherine? How much of it was revising and editing. I was reading through the acknowledgments. It sounds like there is a great team involved, which I think any great book has, a, has, a, has, a, has to have a great team, just like most businesses. So can you guys both walk me through what, what it was like working yeah, together? Let, to, me, to let me start. Let me start first. I had started to write a book and we and really, the reason I wanted to write a book, frankly, is for my grandchildren. I didn't write this for the public. I wrote it for the grandchildren because I wanted them to understand why grandpa didn't spend the time with them when they grew up. You know, with a lot of you, you see a lot of movies and you see a lot of shows where grandpas at every polo, at every, uh, every meet, you know, the skating read or whatever it is, they're there. I wasn't there. I was working my ass off on something else, on something like this. And uh, I explained this and we had an author. He started writing the book. When he gave me back the book, I said, who wrote this? I didn't even, he wrote a book about himself. It wasn't my book. And when I did with, with, with uh, Catherine, I wrote it, I, I discussed all these with, and she gave me back what I said. She listened to me and she put it on paper and she put it better than I could speak it. Much better. She's terrific and she represents me. She knows more about me today than I think I know about myself. Wow. Wow. Catherine, tell, walk me through. What was it like for you? Well, Bernie, that's very sweet. Uh, we we spent a lot of time together. Bernie's a great storyteller. And I think that's what made the book uh, such a good project. When you write a book together, it's a little bit like being married. Um, you, you really spend a lot of time. It's a very intimate conversation. You learn a lot about somebody's life. So I had always known, I mean, Bernie's, Bernie's Bernie Marcus, right? He's one of the most famous people in the world. So... Uh, I knew the story, uh, at least the scaffold of the story, but we started right, Bernie, in the middle of COVID. Um, and so we had some time um, to really sit back and we just started a series of conversations. And depending on our schedules, uh, some of it was in person, some of it in Atlanta, some of it in Florida, some of it on Zoom. And what we would do is kind of work our way through different parts of Bernie's story. Um, and he would tell me all these great stories and we laughed a lot. And there's, there's a, a number of really funny stories in the book. Bernie, I know the Sam Walton, not having the air conditioning and your underwear getting wet and having dinner with Cary Grant in 21. I mean, you gotta read the book to, uh, to get Bernie's full story. And the cat skills when you were a hypnotist, I mean, Every conversation we had uh, illuminated some, uh, one great story, uh, but also great lesson. And so Bernie and I would sort of talk and talk and talk and I'd write and then we'd come back together and uh, we'd talk some more and he would read it and say, you've got this right, or maybe we should change this or let's shift this around. Bernie, I think we went through, I don't know, 90 titles and uh, we had a great team with uh, William Morrow uh, and Esmond Harmsworth, our, our agent, was terrific. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really a conversation. And uh, Bernie's story just jumps off the page because it's a terrific story. It's a great rags to riches. Uh, but it's also more than that. I think what makes Bernie unique, a lot of successful CEOs in America, right? And many of them are playing golf and sitting on yachts. Uh, 
and Bernie Marcus is transforming autism, cancer care, veterans, um, building a blood bank in Israel, transforming uh, education for youth. Uh, Bernie is as committed today and working as hard today as he did at Home Depot. And I think what makes the book really interesting uh, is it shows when you're successful in one arena in business, how can you parlay that uh, into another arena, philanthropy? And Bernie does a terrific job um, really um, championing something we call entrepreneurial philanthropy, that Bernie looks at philanthropy like a business. Um, and there's a bottom line and you've got to have great leaders. I know, Ryan, you asked a really good question. You know, this is a leadership podcast. And Bernie, you could talk until uh, the end of time about what makes a good team um, and who you hire. And I think there, there's a great story in the book, Bernie, if you'll tell it, um, about how you can learn. I think you were walking a store and somebody on the floor, a young guy who had only been there like 90 days was really struggling with something. And you stopped and asked him a question. Um, do you remember this story? And he, uh, he gave you some advice that you all transformed the way you did it and saved yourself millions of dollars. Yep. That's Happen leadership. Yep, happened all the time. Uh, yep. th this whole thing about listening very carefully. Um, I remember one story, I'll tell you one story. I, I remember it's in the book, um, uh, you have to remind me, but I was outside a store in California and I was helping a customer load his truck and he had all, oh, yeah. on, he had no nails. And I said that, I just turned to him and said to me, um, how are you going to put all this together? And he said, well, you're going to nail them together. I said, how are you going to nail them? You don't have any nails. He said, oh, I don't buy nails here. And I said, why don't you buy nails here? And he said, because your nails are no good. I said, what do you mean our nails are no good? He said, they break and they bend. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? I went back in the store and I got a board and I went over to the nail department, got a hammer, and I started knocking some nails in. And they bent and they broke. And I, and I said, what is going on here? Nobody is listening. So the, the, the people came over and said, we, we talked to the buyer and the buyer said the nails are fine, but we don't, we send our customers to, to a competitor. Well, you don't build a business by selling customers to a competitor. And so the merchant wasn't listening and he thought he was smarter than the customer. And of course he didn't last long. But the point is that you have to listen all the time because that's how you learn. And uh, we have story after story. Um, and I think that it happens because Arthur and I both spend time in the stores. Ken Langone spends time in the stores. Our board spends time in the stores. Every one of our board's members on Home Depot board must spend time in the stores and must report back on what they heard from the associates. The associates know more than anybody. They're in contact with the customers. And if you don't respond to it, you're a dead duck. So the key is you have to surround yourself with people who believe what you believe. So we, did, we adopted a program early on that no matter where you worked at the Home Depot, if you were a lawyer and you joined our, our legal staff, you had to work in the store for a period of two or three weeks. You had to know what the problems were. You had to know what the customers were up against because otherwise you couldn't represent us. And the same thing with an HR person or anybody else, they had to work in the stores and understand what was going on in the stores because that's where our business was, that's where our business is, and that's what makes us success, uh, successful. Uh, the customers make us successful. They're the ones that make our business. Uh, they don't have to come to Home Depot. We don't own customers, they're on lease. 
and it's a short-term lease. <laughs> if you don't provide what they want, they go somewhere else. If they go somewhere else, we don't have a business. So our key is to fight for those customers every day to make sure they're happy with what we give them, with happy with the service, happy with the quality, happy with happy with the cost, happy with all of those things. So they keep coming back to us. One of the other partnerships that I read about in your book that I, I selfishly have to ask you about is um, your wife, Billy. Uh, almost 50 years uh, together. And in the world that you live in with running a business, getting fired, starting a business, I mean, that is tough, man. Uh, I, I got to imagine having a, as, as someone that you call the love of your life and your best friend what what talk to me about that relationship and how it how it helped you as a leader well she's very unique she's unique in that she wants to accomplish the same thing that i do in her own right she's a philanthropist mm -hmm. she has her own foundation and she gives away a lot of money every year and uh but she was so supportive uh, i remember many years ago we were ma Mulholland Drive, we were broke. I, we were looking down at the site of the, the, and we were talking about getting married. And I said to her, if you want diamonds, you got the wrong guy. You're not gonna get diamonds. I would rather fix a cleft palate than give you a diamond <laughs> of a kid. And she said, so would I. And we bonded because we both believe in the same thing. She's as good natured as I am. She believes in people. She loves people. And she wants to help people as much as possible. And she's been a support, just a rod for me all these years. And again, continues to be a rod. We're lucky we have each other still at this age. What's the key as you go through different life stages I read I read an article recently, like you got to fall in love like seven or eight with like seven or eight different people, meaning it's the same person, but you grow and things change and you evolve and you're still the, you still the, hopefully have the same values and you're the same person. But, you know, we grow. And so you've gone through a lot of those stages. What's that like and what's the key to making sure that it's that it continues to go well? Uh, I, think, I think the key is uh, listening to each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes we get into arguments and we think we're right and we don't listen to the answers and we just close our ears. And uh, I remember years ago giving a speech to the wives of Home Depot managers. And I said to them, I said, Billy and I, and I'm going to tell you something I don't put in the book but Billy and I take a bath together every night. What does it mean? It means we're both naked in the bathtub. <laughs> it means we're both defenseless. Yeah. And we don't go to bed ever, ever angry at each other, hmm. ever, ever. We solve whatever problems we have before we go to bed. Once you go to bed angry, you wake up angry and you think about what you should have said and what you could have said and then you get then you get into this battle and the battle gets worse billy and i never had that because i told everybody we take a bath together so what do you think happened we started selling bathtubs all over the home depot <laughs> all our managers, everybody started taking, taking baths together and so i think i think we had a lot to do with that but, it, but, it, but it's what worked in our marriage and what works in our marriage works in our life. And it works with our grandchildren and our children as well. She protected me when I wasn't there. In other words, if I couldn't be there for some kind of uh, function that mm -hmm. one of my kids had, she was able to cover for me. And in a way where she didn't have to make excuses, let's say, you know, daddy is doing something that's helping the world. Uh, as I said, this book is all about that. 
when my kids read the book, they'll realize what I've been doing all my life and understand why I didn't spend time with them. Yeah. Well, I, I highly encourage people to get the book. Bernie, Catherine, I think you guys did an amazing job. Kick up the name of it is Kick Up Some Dust. By the way, Kick Up Some Dust. You said there were 90 different titles. Why uh, why kick up some dust? Why did you guys choose this? Well, because it's apropos. Do something. Yeah. Get off your rear end and yeah. do something. Uh, it, no, I don't care if you're wealthy, really wealthy. If you're not really wealthy, you can volunteer for things. Just get off your ass and do something. Yeah. And that that's what it means, actually. Well, I think I'm going to frame the list of titles, Bernie, because we really did go through a lot of them. Uh, but one thing, Ryan, I think as you, as you talk about Bernie's story, you probably see Bernie invented do-it-yourself, yep. right? If there's a do-it-yourself movement, it's Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank and Home Depot, right? There was not, that concept did not really exist in the 1970s. People hired contractors, right? You didn't put your own toilet in or tile in. So not only do they invent do-it-yourself for home improvement, but then Bernie translates that into philanthropy. And, you know, Bernie could easily write a check, walk away, I don't know, do a cruise around the world with Billy. And he just doesn't do it, right? He rolls up his sleeves and he builds the Georgia Aquarium, right? And puts a, you know, uh, puts that on the map, right? He helps solve autism and create Autism Speaks. Uh, he helps do a liquid biopsy test at Johns Hopkins that'll test 26 cancers before it reaches stage one. Mm -hmm. um, this is a do-it-yourself man. And so we played around with titles and played around with titles. And Bernie, I think you told me the story that Arthur had a poster mm -hmm. outside his office that said, kick up some dust. Yeah. And you told me that long ago when we were trying to come up with these titles and we're brainstorming and talking and, you know, working through the marketing team at, at William Morrow. And finally, on a Friday afternoon, I am just done. I'm like, I have had it. <laughs> and I went back through the manuscript and there was that story. And I called Bernie and I said, what do you think? Kick up some dust. And that is Bernie Marcus. Uh, mm. He has kicked up dust from the mo from the time, Bernie, that you were a child, you know, working in the Catskills all the way today to today. And I think that's an extraordinary part of the story. So the title uh, has got your personality all over it. Like I said, you, you've done a, a wonderful job of, of getting the stories out of out of his, his mind onto the page, both of you. And uh, it's it's a pleasurable read too. It's 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 certainly there's a ton of learning if you're a leader and you're you're striving to build something. You're going to learn a ton, but also I, I think be entertained along the way, and that's uh, that's the way I like books to be. So I really appreciate. Bernie's a it. funny guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and, and and also it just I appreciate Bernie too. You sharing like the personal aspects. How how old are you right now? Ninety three. Ninety three, and how old's Billy? She's uh, eight years younger than I am. Okay, and nice. she's actually. Uh, 10 years younger than I am. <laughs> she's, she's terrific and she's still going strong. I love it, man. I, I, there's just so much to learn. I encourage people too to have these buckets of people in your life who are ahead of you, who are beside you and behind you as far as the ones that we can learn from. We can learn from all three of them, but but also putting ourselves in the position to learn from the experiences of other people. And that's why I was so looking forward to this conversation, Bernie, and you certainly exceeded those expectations. So thank you so much. I would love to continue our dialogue as we both progress, because I know that you got a lot going on and a lot more to do. So I, I'm, I'm just pumped and, and, and grateful for your time today, man. Well, thank you for putting the time into it. Absolutely. Thank you, enjoy, Catherine. It's great to talk the, to you, too. Enjoy the book. We will. Kick up some dust lessons on thinking big, giving back, and doing it yourself. Thanks so much again. Thank you. Bye-bye.